Hi. Welcome to Restrocast. Today my guest is Nadeem Majdalani, CEO of Ethos. Nadeem packs over 17 plus years of experience across private equity and restaurants. Somebody whose career was built over not only great work but even better relationships. Relationships with the world of money where credibility and your results are everything. Somebody who believes that you need to find family at workplace or rather friends at workplace to make life better. Nadeem has probably played all kinds of roles between the spectrum of private equity and restaurants so starting from you know, being on the private equity buying side to you know being an investor on board to the restaurant groups to becoming an operator himself and taking over as a ceo for the company what's great about nadeem's outlook on restaurant industry is that it's a balanced view when it comes to deep questions like whether to go all out on the physical restaurants or whether to do dark kitchens and virtual brands but at the same time finds its balance in the fundamental principle that customer is king and if your brand is customer centric customer is going to uh, order from you doesn't matter which kind of format you operate nadeem is also somebody who is a keen learner uh, somebody who is talking about podcasts as one of his greatest source of learning i loved my conversation with nadeem for he brings passion to this industry which i saw swinging both sides equally from finance to the culinary side and the brand and the customer experience to watch welcome to restaurant Nadeem, welcome to Restrocast. Thanks, Ashish. Thanks for welcoming me, and uh, I look forward to this discussion. Thank you for accepting our invite. Um, from what I what I read, what I saw, you know, so far, Nadeem, a great, enriching journey. I can, I can see, uh, you know, very rare few, you know, are the ones who start something and then, you know, return back to it. And and I think I'm. uh i am really interested in that part i really have the urge to jump to that but i will <laughs> you know hold that i want to know how did you get into the restaurant industry uh you know in the first place because my thesis is that nobody chooses this kind of insanity for themselves it just happens they, <laughs> they get trapped somehow right. and they start you know living and loving the pain what happened so um my journey into the restaurant space started uh, probably on my first day uh, as a as a professional um so i i studied engineering in lebanon uh, then did a masters in the us and uh, uh eventually decided to uh, move away from engineering and into the investment world um because the masters i did was a little bit away from engineering i did a masters in construction management uh, i'm a civil engineer by training Uh, and it started uh, you know i felt like i was not going to be an engineer all my life and i wanted to be closer to business so that was my bridge um so my first uh, job was working in uh, in private equity uh, investing in uh, in paris in a family office called uh, quilvest uh, and on my first day on the job um, i get assigned uh, a project or a portfolio company to follow uh, quilvest had made an investment in a in a french uh, chain called pomme de pain which uh, was at the time probably one of the largest uh, if not the largest chain of sandwiches in uh, in France with north of 50 uh, 50 locations mm-hmm. um and so uh, I, i saw private equity myself as a uh, as a way to get especially quilvest was not a uh, industry uh, specialized they were kind of industry agnostic looking after the fundamentals of the companies rather than the industry in particular Uh, and so i i saw this as an opportunity to get acquainted and get exposed to a bunch of different industries eventually decide 
which industries I really like and maybe move out of the investment world and, and closer to the operation down at some point down in my career. So on the first day, I got uh, I got assigned to Pomme de Pain, started following the investment with the, with the investment uh, director who was uh, following it. And um, I kind of liked it. Uh, first, I think a lot of people like the restaurant industry because they believe it's an easy industry, right? I mean, you, you know it as a customer. Uh, you kind of have a sense of how it's operated. It's glamorous. It's glamorous. Uh, you, you, you want to eventually own a restaurant and be able to, to, you know, to brag about it and invite your friends over. 100%. Um, and people don't really understand the complications behind it. But eventually, when, uh, when, uh, when I started, I didn't see all the complications. I saw um, the ability of scaling businesses. Uh, from an investment perspective, so I was wearing my you know, obviously my, my investor hat. Uh, it's easy to ex- understand and explain how you can uh, invest in a restaurant chain, grow it, eventually sell it, and make a good return out of it. So on an Excel sheet. On an Excel sheet. So uh, so you invest, uh, you put some debt while you're uh, before acquiring with the business. Uh, <laughs> with the profit, you repay the debt. With the cash, you continue growing the company with more debt, probably. And at some point, uh, if you're able to have a, a concept which has strong unit economics, you'll grow it, and eventually you'll uh, you'll you'll sell you'll sell it with uh, with, a, with a decent profit. Um, so that was my first foray into the restaurant uh, industry. Now, Quillvest, as a result of this investment and looking at some others, started developing a little bit of a focus uh, thesis around uh, thesis around it, both in Europe where I was based. As well as in the U.S., they so so Quilves had done a bunch of restaurant deals in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, looked at a bunch also, which we lost because of high valuation. So after Pomme de Pain, my, my so Pomme de Pain, we were a minority shareholder, so we're not very active. We're not sitting on the board. But my first, the, the first time I really dove into the restaurant industry is when we acquired a chain in the U.K. called Yo Sushi. So uh, we acquired, you know, the, the, we acquired the whole company uh, alongside the management at team at Quilves, yeah. So uh, alongside the management team, uh, the founder, uh, Robin Rowland, stayed, uh, uh, <coughs> stayed um, uh, as CEO uh, to help us in uh, the, the, the growth of the company. Mm. And since we were majority shareholders, we were sitting on the board. It was the, my first experience actually sitting on the board um, and, uh, and living the, on a monthly basis the challenges that they were facing and learning so much from uh, Robin per, specifically, uh, someone who uh, followed me in my career. I, mean, I followed also in my career. Um, and we were on the on the on the deals where we were majority shareholders. We were uh, quite <coughs> active, mm. uh, so we had a, an active approach, trying to support the management teams wherever we could, with our uh, you know analytical firepower, etc. So I helped Robin look into the opportunity of expanding Yosushi into the U.S. Uh, spent a lot of time with uh, with him looking at this specifically. Um, spending time in the restaurants to really understand the economics. Uh, and so this is where I kind of got... What year was this? That's 2008, 2007, 2008. Mm. Um, so two years into my career into private equity. Mm. Um, and uh, I kind of loved it. I mean, it's, it was also a good period for, uh, for Yosushi, growing a lot, uh, mm. generating great uh, you know, unit economics, very profitable units. And... Uh, you know, we, we, we all only had positive uh, stories to share, etc. at the time. Uh, before it hit a little bit of a hard place in an, in an economic downturn. But uh, during those times, I really, out of all the industries, I, I, so I did deals in, uh, you know, uh, retail, uh, clothing. We did deals in, uh, in uh, safety equipment like, uh, like car seats for, uh, for kids. Uh, all sorts of different industries. But the one which I, which I really, you know, got... Uh, interested and excited about was the restaurant industry so then i went to get my mba for a couple of years came back and but uh, what was the lure so you know you were on the board you saw and you're you're working with the founder yeah you already saw your your sushis you know like from a from a good kind of like your chair was frontline seats let's sure. say right uh what what was the lure like what what is it what was that oversimplified idea you had of that oh wow you know this is great like why is this a great business in those days if you if you remember so at that time i started seeing the the, the complexity of the business so i i never 
initially I was like, oh, that's a great industry. Let's dive into it, etc. I saw the complications, but eventually you've got complications across all different industries, right? And mm-hmm. what I really liked about this industry is how um, how tangible is the impact you can do and how fast you can see it. So uh, it's obviously it's a customer facing industry. Uh, it's a B2C business, not a B2B. So it's limited room for error uh, at the end of the day. Every mistake can, uh, can be very costly. <coughs> Um, but at the same time, when you're running a restaurant uh, and you see that sales are not doing great and you start evaluating the team, you you can guess from team dynamics maybe that maybe, oh, you've got the wrong manager for that team. He may not be a bad guy, but he may not be the right guy for mm. that type of team. So rather than changing your, the whole team, you just shift around the managers across sites and, and you see how fast uh, things get turned around. I mean, how how the the, the, the team dynamics can change. Uh, how and how quality of service eventually uh, gets reflected right away on the on the sales and on on returning customer loyalty, sure, etc. Sure. So, so it's this element of being able to touch the the, 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 the what you're doing on a, on a daily basis, uh, uh, see the initiatives uh, that you're doing, whether on new product product development, whether on marketing activities. Um, I learned a lot about uh, with the Robin about the five P's. I mean, he was always about the, you know the five P's about product and price, and promotion and people and and place. Uh, so he was my school. I mean, at the end of the day, spending so much time with him allowed me to really understand all the you know kind of all the elements of uh, mm-hmm. uh, of uh, of the restaurant industry. Being on the board as an investor gives you this this kind of unique vantage point where you're able to to have this kind of 360 degrees view on the business uh, and decide where, where you eventually want to uh, dig into a bit more. And so they were always, you know, uh, trying to read PNLs. Uh, okay, why is staff cost higher in this unit versus this unit? Dive it's into also, it. I think, the privilege of uh, you know having a zoomed out 360 degree view and the power to zoom in, you know, to something is is, is quite uh, right and quite cool. And 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 you're able to do that if you're uh, on the board as, or as a shareholder, and if you're kind of uh, if your your approach is more of a hands-on uh, approach. So we were not meddling in there day to day, but at the same time we uh, they they valued our uh, you know our approach and our uh, uh, they they saw the value we could add, and so uh, so yeah I mean that was the really why why did you go for MBA. So, so um, my, um, I grew up in, um, in uh, Lebanon, uh, no, so I, I was born in Lebanon. Uh, my father passed away um, uh, when I was less than one year old, so I never met my father. I was, I was uh, raised by my mother, eventually my stepfather down the line. Mm. Um, and my mother uh, is an <coughs> overachiever. She's a super achiever, super woman. She, I mean, she spent all her career uh, in the United Nations, you know, in the Children's Fund, UNICEF. Oh. Uh, supporting children wow. and going on missions in uh, Rwanda and uh, all sorts of uh, difficult uh, places. Um, so I saw her as a as a uh, as an overachiever, and she she was always pushing me. She was always uh, uh, you know t- you know pushing me to get better grades and to be uh, ambitious and to go for the best. Uh, uh, you know, the, always be the top of uh, top top the top quartile was not enough. You need to be the top decile. Um, and down the line, uh, eventually, when I, I, I finished my undergrad, I, so I lived in, 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 Fran- in Lebanon, then, then Jordan, then France, eventually fin- finished my high school in Lebanon, did my undergrad in Lebanon. And uh, as, as, as I was applying to business school, uh, to, uh, to my ma- first master's, um, I, I, it was as much about achieving myself as much as uh, basically uh, getting her uh, validation, if you if you like, mm. um, uh, and I was able to get that, so I got admitted first into Stanford for my first master's, and eventually, I saw a point that when when I was working in private equity, if I really wanted <coughs> to reach the, the the top levels and be a partner eventually down the line, I had no plans at the at that time uh, to move out of private equity when I uh, when mm. I went for my MBA. Mm. Um, so I felt I needed to get an MBA. So I applied to. Two schools only, um, INSEAD, which had a one-year program, and I applied to the Harvard Business School. Eventually, got into Harvard. My employer, Quilvest, uh, 
wanted me back, so they financed part, a uh, big part of my uh, my MBA. So that was a good couple of years. Uh, I, I had a little bit of a different experience versus some other of my, some of my some of my other classmates because um, I went there married and with a child. Uh, so my son was one year old. My second son was born there. Uh, so it was a very interesting, probably my best two years. And took, of your, my life. took your family there. So while yeah, you my, we, we moved. We moved. All of us. We moved out of wow. uh, Paris and to to Boston for a couple of years. Uh, so as as my you know most of my classmates were uh, going on uh, weekend trips all over uh, i was uh, i was more of uh, you know the family guy um uh, but enjoyed it so much i mean it was a, a wonderful couple of years it's a big investment both from uh, how much it costs yeah. and from an opportunity cost as well because these are two years where you're in your prime uh, prime uh, professional and growth. moving the family, I think it's a moving like, the family at a, a commitment and aspiration yeah, exactly, level. It's a, a big, big disruption as well. Uh, but yeah, I felt like I needed that if I really wanted to progress and have be on a fast pace uh, in, uh, in in my career in private equity. Uh, eventually, came back, so they financed that. I had the commitment to stay with them for a, for four years after my uh, my MBA, uh, and I was happy to come back. I mean, it was a wonderful uh, company. Uh, to work for and a group group of people as well, um, and when I came back, I met with a partner who had joined in the interim, who had a long experience in the restaurant space. So th- so he had started as a restaurateur himself, and eventually uh, after after being in, in cooking school, um, and uh, and we we clicked really well. So uh, his name is Ziad Jumblad. So. We, uh, I started working with him on a bunch of deals that he was looking at in the restaurant space, um, and eventually, uh, we, you know, he we clicked well because I knew the, he, you know, I knew the industry from before before my MBA. Uh, he knew it well, and also from a personal perspective, we uh, we uh, were uh, you know getting along, um, and so at some point we get a, we, we we would get approached by some of our investors uh, at uh, at Colvest from the region here from the Middle East. Uh, and Quilves had never made an investment in the Middle East. They were they had an office in Dubai, but mostly for fundraising purposes, to as a representative office to fund month to fundraise to invest mostly in the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Um, and they told us, "You guys did a bunch of deals in the restaurant space. Why don't you look at the restaurant uh, sector here in the Middle East? Because so much is happening." We're talking. This is 2012, 2013. Yeah, I was about to ask. Um, so, so this, this is the took, this is the time when is exactly the so boom then, time. It was yeah exactly. So a couple of years export twenty twenty has been announced exactly. So uh, so twenty fourteen it was announced if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it was b- right before the announcement, mm. but uh, you know all the malls were opening up. I mean yeah. Dubai was uh, had gone through the crisis and recovered, um, and uh, they told us you guys know the restaurant space better than most of the funds we we talk to. So why don't you look at it? And if you guys decide that it makes sense, we'll back you. Mm. So at the time, what is today Ethos uh, started on a piece of paper uh, in an office in Paris. Um, and uh, and at the time, I told uh, Ziad, listen, I mean, you're working on that. I really want to get, I really want to help you. I want to work on, on this. Because at the time I was starting, I had second kid. I was starting to think, to feel like life in Paris was a bit uh, difficult uh, when you have young kids. Um, so? From a logistics perspective, mm. uh, you know, if you've got a couple of working parents, uh, you know, getting help, uh, the schooling, it's, it's a very fast paced environment, big sure. city, metro, <coughs> metropolitan city. Mm. Uh, it was far from our parents who were getting older as well uh, in, uh, in Lebanon. So at the, t- at the time, we were like, okay, why don't we consider uh, a move towards the Middle East? And so, so I helped uh, Ziad. Uh, we, were, we built a small team looking at the opportunity including a colleague here in, uh, in, uh, in Dubai. It was spearheaded by Fadi Abu Sharash, who was the CEO of, uh, of uh, uh, Quilvest, and is today still the, I mean, we continue, and he's the chairman of Ethos as we speak. Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, so you started Ethos as a part of that? As part of Quilvest, but uh, at the time, um, uh, it was it was built as a separate entity to Quilvest, uh, and the idea was to, uh, to open uh, restaurants across the MENA region, uh, and do three things. One is to uh, uh, open, uh, to, to sign franchise rights for concepts which from, mostly from the West were not present in the region because that was really working at the time. Uh, look at M&A acquisitions because that's my background as well. 
And eventually down the line, we knew that the risk profile was higher, but eventually down the line, create our own uh, concepts. And we did all, all of these uh, in the last uh, 10 years since ETHOS has been, or nine years since ETHOS has been operational. Um, I joined, um, I joined, uh, I decided midway through the, the project that, uh, that uh, so at that point I approached Fadi, and I told him, listen, Fadi, um, uh, you know, I, when we had always discussed that I would be working at Quillvest uh, with the idea of seeing different industries and eventually deciding which one I like most, well, I've decided. Um, I, I want to work in the restaurant industry. I want to get closer to the, to the Middle East, uh, where my family is at, uh, our parents, etc. So I want to move out of the investment uh, space and into the, you know, into the transition. Is this post ethos coming out? Sit in the middle of ethos being uh, started. Basically. Be, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so he said, "Are you sure?" Etc. I said, <coughs> yeah, I've, "I've decided. Uh, I want to be. I want to be on the ops operational side." So he said, "Okay, sure." So I was technically the employee number one of ethos when it was mm. still mm. Uh, a project on paper. But uh, how much of a shock? Or, or, or difference was being the navigator who feels that he knows what it what it is like to drive, yeah. and now being really so. So, so let's say I, I, it was a half of a jump. Let's call it this way. My role, <coughs> so I was not running the company at the time. So at the start, I was running finance because of my background and the business development. Yeah. Uh, and we hired uh, a gentleman. His name is Faisal Yunus mm-hmm. to be. The CEO of the company, he came from the from Azadea before, uh, and so he was he was the he was in charge of all the ops. He had all the operational background, uh, and I was I was focused on deal making from a business development perspective, signing new franchises, looking at new locations as well, uh, and uh, I was in charge of finance initially. Uh, as we grew, we we, we brought in a financial uh, CFO. And I was really focused at the time in, in, in corporate development. We did a couple of M and A deals, which uh, which until today have been you know very uh, very great. I mean, great uh, uh, deals for us. Uh, we bought Sushi Art, which is the franchise uh, of Sushi Shop, which is a, a European based uh, chain. Uh, and we acquired Joga, which is a homegrown concept here, which was started by. Uh, uh, Lebanese gentleman, his name is Ziad Madi. We we bought the business in 2018. From what is it called? Joga. Joga. We, they do mostly, uh, well, we do uh, uh, wraps, salad, sandwiches, mostly lunch business. We're present in office clusters in uh, the IFC Media City, uh, and these kinds of you know high, highly populated uh, office clusters. Um, and so I played that role. Uh, there was a change of CEO down the line. Uh, great gentleman, his name is Andy Holman, uh, came in in uh, 2018 to to steer the to steer the company. At the time, I became uh, chief development officer. So I had a, there was a like a, a transition period where I, I took the reins uh, in between Faisal and Andy. So that was really that was really when I really dove into it. Which which year was that? Uh, so that's uh, 2017. So between call it May 2017. And uh, early 2018, when uh, when uh, Andy came in, and uh, and this is where, I mean, where I got really uh, into it. And I think the, the the aspect which was the the toughest and the the biggest uh, the biggest uh, shock for me is around managing a team. Uh, so I was always second in line before that, and now all of a sudden you're you're uh, at the helm. You're have your the team reporting to you. With the sensitivities around the team that you need to uh, to take care of, mm. um, some tensions. You know, it, it was not always rosy. We had you know some some uh, some uh, bad locations we entered into, some bad brands that we uh, so not, not not bad brands by, per se, but not for maybe not yeah. the right brand for the the right time and in, mm. in the in the, for the context. Um, and so managing that was the I think the toughest part of the business. Uh, uh, I like to do deals, uh, and now all of a sudden, that was not the, the key priority. I mean, I had to do some firefighting, both from a team's perspective, from a restaurant's perspective. Uh, we had a, a growing uh, Saudi business, uh, which was not performing exactly as, as per our expectations. Uh, so it was a little bit of a, a baptism by fire, um, but. I learned so much during these uh, these eight months. Now I was happy that eventually uh, Andy came in 
that I was able to focus again on the on the on the business development side of things, uh, which eventually takes us a couple of years later. COVID starts, um, uh, but you moved out in between, right? So I moved out after uh, in 2020. So so okay, COVID started COVID. early okay. 20. So COVID started. Obviously, we all know when COVID started early 2020. Sure. Um, the the <coughs> business goes through a very difficult time. Sure. Uh, like all customer facing businesses, we 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 do much. We do I think better than some of our competitors because delivery was a key key element of all our concepts. So uh, it's not like we discovered delivery and we started having to do it uh, during, uh, COVID. Uh, during COVID as an afterthought. Mm, mm. All our concepts were geared towards delivery. So actually we benefited from a market share grab perspective right. in hindsight during that period. And we did it well. I mean, we had you know proper packaging, proper operations for deliveries, et cetera. So we're not discovering it. Um, uh, but we went through, I mean, I saw Andy steer the ship uh, you know, brilliantly during the time um, uh, I saw what em- empathetic leadership meant in terms of what the decision he took to keep everyone uh, in the company. We all took, you know, significant pay uh, cuts. Uh, cuts for a few months. I think between April and September, and eventually we got back uh, to our salaries. We did not let anyone go, uh, so that was a big commitment from him because he saw that there was going to be light at the end of the tunnel. Eventually. Having to, uh, first of all, from a human perspective, where would these people go? There was nowhere to go at the time, and uh, and uh, and also down the line, it was a good investment also down the line because there was going to be light at the end of the tunnel, and we we wanted to be positioned well at the end. Sure. Um, so we did a lot of investments into dark kitchen and virtual brand at the time. You know, it was the the, the hot topic, uh, and and for many reasons, uh, most some of them personal, some of them uh, professional. Um, I decided that uh, it was time for me to see something else. Uh, so we're talking summer of twenty, uh, summer of twenty twenty. Um, I got approached by uh, Majid Al Futem, which is uh, the largest retail lifestyle conglomerate in, sure. the, in the region, um, and uh, they offered me uh, the position of uh, head uh, VP of corporate development for uh, Maf Retail, which is the Carrefour entity. Uh, so 400 plus locations across 17 <coughs> countries, and I would be looking after. Uh, uh, it's kind of a almost like an entrepreneur inside the inside the uh, the entity, where we would be looking at creating new businesses for uh, for Carrefour. So looking at B two B in particular, uh, looking at joint venture uh, opportunities, overseeing all the relationship on the delivery side with the aggregators. Mm. So. Um, so it was a very exciting role in a large company, and for many reasons, I decided that uh, I had hit, uh, you know, the end of the road uh, at uh, at Itos, and I wanted to try something else. Sure. So um, it was a very difficult decision. It's probably, I mean, still remember it today. I mean, uh, the call I had to make to Fadi first, our chairman, who was my mentor at the end of the day. He, we we met. I mean, first day he. He interviewed me uh, for uh, for my role at uh, Colvest back mm-hmm. in the day. He actually, the story is quite funny. He, I met, I had met him a year <coughs> earlier, and I was interviewing for after my uh, my consulting job. I wanted to get to back to Paris after my uh, my uh, master's in engineering, um, and uh, he has a background in uh, in uh, consulting, management consulting, and I wanted to do consulting. It was you know it was an exciting uh, uh, thing to do uh, at the time. So. So I started interviewing, uh, getting interviews in Paris for a consulting job. And so uh, I had met him a year earlier, and he, he helped me. He was very gracious and uh, you know, gave me a couple of hours to kind of coach me into what, what a, a consulting interview uh, um, uh, is all about and what they ask typically, et cetera. And so he didn't know me uh, from a business perspective we knew, uh, really well. And so we, we, we learned a lot about each other in these two, <laughs> two hours. Uh, and so eventually, I started doing my interviews, and I stayed in Paris for uh, for a couple of weeks to do all these interviews. So I the, saw him again, and he took me out for dinner one day, and uh, and uh, I think that was when he said he he thought that okay maybe Nadim could help in uh, in our organization. So he took he asked for a piece of paper from uh, from the uh, from the waiters and and a pen, and he started drawing on the piece of paper how private equity is so much better than consulting because it's at the intersection of 
So there was a consulting circle, an investment banking circle, a legal circle, and obviously there was an intersection of the three circles and private equity was just there. Uh, and so he sold it uh, to me within, you know, it took him one dinner to, uh, to convince me to, to, to stop, stop everything else I was doing and actually join, uh, join Quilvest. So he's been my mentor since day one. Uh, and having to call Fadi mm. on that day, in, uh, on September 1st, I, re I remember that day. <coughs> September 1st, 2020 is the toughest phone call I've had to make uh, in my life. And I was dreading it and, uh, and it didn't go away. <laughs> oh, um, obviously he was um, he he was uh, he didn't took it very he didn't take it very very positively uh, after you know having worked together for more than fifteen years because um, he expected me to come and tell him I'm thinking of leaving rather than my decision is already made uh, and <laughs> I also and the reason I did that and I think and for good reasons the reason I did that. Uh, is because I didn't want uh, it to look like I was, uh, you know, trying to negotiate my position up or ask for another job, etc. So I had made my decision. I informed him. So for uh, for uh, for a little bit of time, our relationship was not as good as <laughs> as it was. But in you the know past. what? It's it, it's funny that you said that because I am in life personally is of that opinion, of of you know what Fadi expected you to do. Right. I am of that opinion. I I actually am quite vocal about it that yeah. when people work together. In any capacity, yeah, uh, you know, uh, it's not about marrying for life. No, of course. But it's about uh, you know keeping uh, each other informed about the yeah. variables that are hitting you in life. Yeah, yeah. Because life is happening parallel to each other. No, no, of course. Right, and like if if you're drifting apart, like talk about it in time, not just because it can be saved, but maybe just because you know the entire uh, the organism between you two, that 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 team, can bear with it. Uh, dropping it suddenly, you know, can be can be disrupting. No, no, of course, and I think with the benefit of hindsight, I should have done it differently. Uh, so, so with the with the stress and uh, my my uh, with you know COVID going on and having being away a little <laughs> bit also from the family. Um, uh, I think I may have may have I, I was definitely clumsy in my delivery. Uh, and uh, and eventually I regretted it. Regretted the way it happened. Not yeah. Not uh, I, I mean more uh, form over sub, uh, form over sub. No, I think I think the fact that you're speaking about it, you know, speaks volumes anyway. That I mean, it definitely you know speaks volumes over the fact that you care care about it. No, so. no, definitely. I mean, I valued this re this professional relationship as much as any professional relationship I've ever had, and still till today. Uh, so then so yeah, happened? eventually I went went to uh, to ma math. Uh, but uh, at the end, like I said, I mean, I'm employee number one. Ethos is my baby. I mean, everyone knows that in my, you know, this group of uh, friends, my family, and even my, all, uh, you know, all my professional network. Uh, so I stayed in touch with uh, Ethos. People um, uh, enjoyed my time at MAF. I mean, I, 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 it was my first uh, foray into such a large corporate group. I mean, I always used to work in small teams, uh, be it at Quilvest, small teams, um, uh, it was obviously we started from from scratch and uh, and the team was pretty pretty small at the head office at least um, very fast decision making you know kind of uh, sometimes operating in a silo especially in my function business development so kind of left side of the brain uh, starts to decide to do something and right side already started thinking about implementation mm. uh, and all of a sudden you enter a group which is Large. Ten, 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 ten billion uh, plus dollars in, in <coughs> revenues, a mm. uh, billion plus in profit across 17 countries, multiple layers. Um, so it's a new animal for me. I mean, I'm not used to that. Uh, uh, but I, I mean, I'm a kind of a people's person. So I, uh, I, I can, I, I adjust. Um, I learned the ins and outs. Uh, um, and I learned a great deal. I mean, there's a lot of things that today I wouldn't be a prof the professional I am today had I not stepped out to see how large corporates are managed and stepped back in into ethos. And so things around um, processes and procedures, very well structured, etc. Things around performance management of your employees. Uh, what, 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 uh, what's the performance management cycle uh, to evaluate your employees? 
um, the quality of the people as well around the table. Obviously, with a such a sizable group, you can afford to, you know, top uh, top people. So learning a lot from my peers as well. Um, learning from Hani, the CEO, on how uh, on how to manage teams. I mean, eventually being kind of the 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 maestro managing different different personalities, different uh, teams, and all playing. I mean, all going towards uh, the same goal. But I think the things that the, that that I learned most is the power of having a strong vision uh, and strong values, and having them communicated and trickled down all the way till the front line, frontliners. So, so uh, math, the vision was very clear. Um, uh, the vision is to uh, create great moments for everyone every day. Uh, it's a very powerful, uh, powerful vision. Uh, and you and you breathe it on a day-to-day -day basis. There are three values for the company: uh, a bold, passionate, and together. Um, and it, every touch point, you you feel the power of having a strong vision and values, which oh, are very tell, easily. Tell so, me. so I'm going to give you an example. Give me some anecdote. Yeah. Um, so first of all, the vision is everywhere, in the office, in the malls. Um, so. You, on, on the on the introduction day, I mean the the the, the orientation day, you get the pack where the, everything gets really well explained. Uh, in the recruitment process, so when we're hiring people, <coughs> mm -hmm. the evaluation grid uh, is supposed to uh, uh, meet. I mean, the, the the candidates are supposed to meet are supposed to be evaluated on how bold we can we think they can be, how of much of a team player they can be from a togetherness perspective. Uh, and how passionate they are about the industry. And so we had to rank people on that. So it, it, there's a constant reminder of what their values are. And, uh, and uh, in the performance management cycle, same, same thing. You need to evaluate people. And there was a leadership model as well with the, you know, several, I forgot now all of them, but uh, uh, several uh, traits of, uh, of leadership that needed to be followed. And so uh, being, I mean, and, and if you went to a cashier at, uh, at Carrefour, or a cashier at Vox Cinema, everyone would be able to tell you today uh, what's the vision of the company and what are the values of the company. So I thought it was really powerful uh, uh, to align what you're saying is to important. align a whole organization of forty thousand people uh, towards the same vision and uh, uh, and basically the, the the vision is kind of your uh, your uh, direction. Every decision you need to make. Needs to you need to keep that vision in mind uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, use it as a as a direction and you'll make the choice A or choice B based on whether it, it serves the vision or it doesn't uh, and always when all your interactions think about the values of the company togetherness was very important so some point you know you get into an <coughs> argument uh, with uh, with someone from another department eventually if we were both able to step back and think about togetherness you'll find solutions eventually fast forward. Um, uh, I get called by the my, my relationship with Fadi started to get a little bit better. Different life events allowed for that to happen, um, uh, and eventually the board <coughs> calls me back. I mean, Fadi calls me back and uh, and says, "Listen, I mean, uh, uh, there's going to be uh, an upcoming change in leadership. Would you consider coming back as uh, a CEO of Ethos?" Um, and like I said, I had never lost. Uh, you know, connection with the business, mm, with the people, yeah. mostly the people behind the business. Uh, a lot of them I had, you know, either hired myself or interacted with myself directly. Mm. Um, and so while leaving Ethos was the, the, the most, you know, the toughest decision I had to make, coming back is probably one of the easiest I've had to make. Um, You're just walking back into home. Exactly, coming back home. I mean, uh, and that, that's, I mean, when I came back, uh, I had a LinkedIn post, and that's what I said. Mm. Uh, coming back home, um, it it just I, I felt like I belonged, right? This is where I always belonged, uh, and I was I was very happy to come back. I was I was uh, very grateful for the couple of years I spent at MAF, learned a great deal. Um, you know, left some wonderful colleagues uh, behind, who uh, a lot of them are still my friends today. But I felt like. I, I knew what needed to happen for Ethos to move to the next level. I, I, I could say, I mean, I, I, I could really know. I could what, was, really... what was that? And was it, was it because you, 
you know after running it like being a part of that from the inception to so many years uh, you know the blindness that all of us get genuinely because you're on the field so you sure. you lose the sight of the field stepping out at times just gives you a bigger picture yes did that happen yeah yeah so looking at it from the outside in helped definitely the two years i spent at maf helped as well i mean another thing i learned at maf is the power of uh, of omni channel uh, and of uh, of data uh, and I, i i mean omni channel was you know a big priority of mine when i came back to ethos uh, there were a few strategic choices that were made uh, by uh, towards the end of my first life at ethos that i wasn't fully aligned on and uh, and which ended up uh you know being bets in dark kitchen space for example or virtual brand creation space which ended up not not as profitable as initially anticipated uh, uh and i kind of knew there were some low hanging fruits uh, that we could uh, we could extract from the business uh some things that needed to close some things needed to close. so so i had a very strong uh view of how I could help the business and you are building this view while you are watching ethos from outside yes yes and also having discussions with you know privileged uh, discussions with sure, some sure, of the people sure. around sure. Uh, so i i i knew more of about i'm i'm a I'm, i'm a shareholder i stayed a shareholder of ethos by the way during the uh, the years i had left so mm-hmm. so i had visibility as a shareholder and so i knew what what they were struggling with uh, sometime uh, and and what were uh, we i mean um, it was not a business which was suffering and uh, and sure, uh, you know sure. that needed a huge turnaround but that but there were a few things that needed fixing and one of them is around the very strong focus that or uh, emphasis that was put around uh, dark kitchens and virtual brands at a time when uh, when you know at the time of covid and that continued after covid uh, so we have an investor base which is you know quite <coughs> traditional they expect to make their money down the line from selling the business as a restaurant platform sure uh, and we decided to you know we to invest heavily in the dark kitchen space um, and investing maybe on an uneven field versus some of the competitors so you you had you know the kitopis of the world and the reefs of the world who were uh, you're raising also you were thinking about ethos as a competitor well the, at the time i mean that was time. that was one of the disagreements that the, the, but eventually not a level playing field with these guys because they were raising tens and hundreds of millions of dollars also it didn't work for them themselves. well uh, eventually if you look at uh, both of them i think kitopi uh, pivoted their model to some extent right now uh, into more of an omni channel player rather than a dark Correct. kitchen operator and Correct. we can touch on that as well uh, i think it's very interesting what they've done um, but it was at the time when they they were marketing themselves Uh, as a as a tech company right sure. not uh, not as a not as a restaurant operator and commanding you know huge valuations as a result of that and they invested to be fair they invested a lot on their tech and the way their kitchens uh, are set up and uh, uh, and owning the whole you know uh, chain from the tech <coughs> perspective from a to z um, so uh, so huge respect for them but they were pouring tens and hundreds of millions of dollars into yeah. into this uh, developing and we didn't have that kind of money and our investors were after the bottom line not after you know building uh, building top line and and eventually one of the also the reasons why uh, why uh, why uh, uh, people like Kitopi pivoted a little bit their model they they did not change their model but they they started moving more into buying brands which have brick and mortar presence is also uh, because they were profitable and even eventually it will it helped uh, it helped uh, their profit go up and also it helped them get stronger content in their uh, kitchens because it's a race for content uh, the analogy i make in the, in the, in the space for people who are not from the industry is i say a dark kitchen is like netflix so so you've got netflix which is an empty box but uh, so netflix is only as good as the content it has right no one will sign up to netflix if they don't have uh, the strong content and so the dark kitchen is the same Uh, so it's a race to having the strong restaurant brands uh, in your kitchens that we are able to generate volumes without having to market too much Correct. without having the, the to ones give who, too the much the ones discounts. who already have legs exactly and the, you, you don't want to create a brand and then build it it's very difficult to build brands i mean so that's that, that's the other other fallacy <coughs> around building uh, virtual brands So a lot of people started saying it's so easy to create a virtual brand right i mean it's a menu look at these you, guys you, how, how well they're doing exactly 
uh, you create a menu, you, you put some generic packaging, stick a sticker on it uh, with your brand. Uh, it doesn't fly, it's fine, you just replace it. In reality, I mean, uh, that's, uh, if you say that to a marketing person, it just, uh, it just uh, kill you or uh, eventually uh, uh, pass out. It takes years, it takes decades to build brands. Uh, and so thinking that you can build brand. Uh, also, also, I think that, you know, what you're saying is correct. I, you know, I think uh, this entire fallacy of building a brand, I think my perspective is it stems from, um, it stems from this, the lack of conceptual understanding of what a brand is in the first place. Brand is not what you say it is. Brand happens when your customer starts saying something about you. Exactly. Right. And for a customer to start saying something about you, that means you have occupied a part of their mind share for some compartment. Right. Yeah. You can be a particular cuisine or an item or a or a catchment area or geography or whatever. Right. Oh, I'm in this area. I'm going to have this shawarma today. Right. right. It can be a geographical mind share or it can be a item mind share. That has to take many years just, you know, by logic, because that customer has to get reinforced, great experience again and again. Otherwise, how will this happen? It, sure. it won't work, right? So anybody when, when they then say, I think this entire vocabulary, when somebody says, I am going to build a brand, I'm like, no, you don't. Uh, you know, customers build the brand. You, so, so, so you don't I, do anything. I totally agree with you. And, and, and I mean, this fallacy is also the result of the times it was started in, right? I mean, it was COVID. It was a delivery-driven business. Sure. Everyone was doing that. And some people have done well doing that. I mean, some there is the Go Brands, for example, just to give you an example, <coughs> uh, which was started. Which one? Uh, Go Brands. It's called Go Brands, but there was Go Chinese, Go Pasta, Go Salad, yeah. uh, um, and uh, Go Healthy. And so they created a, an umbrella of brands under the Go uh, uh, name. Uh, and so and, and eventually, each one, one of the things uh, the aggregators will tell you is, uh, specialized concepts do better than uh, kind of everything for everyone type of concepts. People, when they go online, all, all the they want to order from a specialist. And so they build this <laughs> reputation of being specialists within the uh, within each of these cuisines. And mm -hmm. eventually, uh, the positive uh, kind of uh, connotation or the positive uh, spread that happened from having Go. So people who would tried Go Chinese and liked it would go and would be more willing to start to, to try... Go, go salad and go pasta, etc. Uh, so they've been successful. Eventually, they were acquired by Kitopi. Uh, but there aren't a lot of people who, a lot of success stories in the virtual restaurant sure. space. And down the line, the world reopened. People start going out again. Uh, and all of a sudden, having brick and mortar presence and became, bigger, uh, better. became important as it used to be, uh, as important as it used to be. And so today, um, uh, we have a couple of virtual brands that we kept today, there's a lot that we had to shut because they were not doing volumes. And eventually, we had to discount a lot for people to try us. We had to buy visibility on aggregators to, to buy us. And eventually, it was not trickling down to the bottom line. We we're losing money on every order. But there's a couple that we, we kept today. Uh, and we're actually bringing them out of the dark. So so uh, brands that started at virtual and now we're opening. Uh, Alien Burger is uh, our burger concept, which we're, uh, which we're taking out of the dark now. First of all, we started going into events. We have a truck now called The Beast. Uh, and um, and uh, we're opening uh, in, uh, in uh, the Khawanij Mirdev area uh, a container uh, soon in, uh, in December. It will open. We have another brand which is very dear to our heart because also we created it from scratch called Mashwa Tabcha, which does Lebanese daily dish concept uh, and uh, which has a very strong following amongst the Levantine uh, community. But I think part of the reason why the, these brands worked is uh, one is the focus on a specific cuisine, the um, consistency and the quality, and eventually the reason the way that we made them look like they're uh, they're real brands. They're not virtual brands. It's not like a generic packaging where you stick, you put a sticker on. Uh, they actually we your only touch point to the customer is the is the packaging, right? When you're a virtual brand. And so we really invested heavily in having top-notch packaging, sealing machines for uh, for the stews of tabcha, uh, so that people are wowed when they open their bag. 
and, and, and a large part of that experience, <laughs> right? When, when a customer walks exactly. into your restaurant, you control that experience. Exactly. But when your food goes out, the you lose oh, part of it. Yeah. You lose a large part of your control of that experience. Exactly. And the only experience they have before eating your food is un- unpacking. Unpacking, exactly. And so we worked a lot on that. And so, uh, be it on the 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 you know the the packaging we're using, the methods we're using to see, like I was saying. Um, the quantities as well. I mean, we, we looking generous uh, at a time where uh, value for money was very important. Mm. I think these are the main reasons why these brands uh, started to really get traction and get repeat orders, etc. cetera. Um, and eventually we decided to bring them out of the, uh, the dark. So, so we're really excited about doing that. next. But just, just to complete the story, right? So you, you basically said that, you know, you were called back, you walked into home, you know, you, you came back home, you, you know, and there were like decisions which were taken at the time, you know, due to COVID for dark kitchens. You, of course, were kind of against them, you know, from a principle, you know, from like how they look and the economics of it. So then what did you like you entered and what did you do? So I'm not against dark kitchen per se. Um, I just thought that betting the future of the of the company on that was uh, was not the, the best use of our capital. Sure. And two, I'm not a believer in virtual brands per se. So dark kitchens can serve a purpose, but we were not using them uh, to serve that purpose specifically, uh, or we're not using them uh, efficiently, basically. So <coughs> what, what I did is, so we opened, we had opened a bunch of kitchens in, hotel, uh, in hotels, for example. There was this wave of saying, okay, uh, hotel kitchens are underutilized assets, so let's go and and pick them up, and we'll take care of the the breakfast, and we'll do you know a, a ton of room service, and uh, and we'll do deliveries from there. Well, guess what? I mean, it's it's difficult to get room service. The the the, the hotels which have decent room service, you know, a, a high level of uh, uh, you know uh, occupancy, typically would like to control the experience, so you end up going into some of the you know apartment hotel apartment hotel or long-term stay hotels where people are not ordering room service uh, are not coming for breakfast sure. and so so this stream of revenue is not there uh, on top of that I mean Dubai municipality comes and smacks you a seven percent municipality retroactively this happened to us um, on uh, delivery revenues that you're doing from the hotel which which kills your profitability at the end of the day and they looked at it retroactively mm. and so we closed all our hotel kitchens. <coughs> we closed, we start, stopped all the virtual brands that were not making money, using, you know, staff and losing money. Sure. But eventually, well, the reason I'm saying uh, we, I'm not against per se, is I, I think betting the future of the company was, the, was not the right approach. But using it as a complement or as an enabler of sure. the brick and mortar strategy is definitely uh, a good approach. Yeah. And, and uh, since I've been back to Ethos, I've, I've, shot i think four dark kitchens four or five dark kitchens but we've also opened three or four dark kitchens um Mm -hmm. but to go back to the netflix fallacy uh, or the netflix uh, the netflix uh, analogy analogy, sorry um we put strong content in these kitchens so we have our strong brands in the kitchens we open we have tortilla we have sushi art we have uh, kababji we have uh, rosa style all our brands which have strong uh, which carry strong brand equity and we're using these kitchens as a radius extender uh, to either reach new areas where we're not that we're not covering properly, test new areas that we want to eventually cover. So it's a great, I mean, uh, dark kitchen. When you think about it, it's a very low, uh, low investment, low capex uh, uh, way of testing a new, uh, new trade area. Yeah. And we've already done, uh, we've gone full circle where we tested the trade area for uh, tortilla and. Uh, in uh, the, the circle uh, JVC area. And now we are signing a location in the JVC area for a brick and mortar. Eventually, the brand will graduate from the from the dark to brick and mortar because I, I actually believe that strongly. It's a graduation it's a, from, it's a plus from, one. From, uh, from, uh, from the dark into becoming customer facing because we've seen it time and again, whenever we were in a trade area with a dark kitchen, whenever we opened uh, a physical location, not only did we benefit from the dine-in business, but the delivery business exploded as well. Correct. Because 
Your all of credibility, people, your credibility goes up. Exactly. Customer know that you're around the corner. You're legend. They know that you're not, uh, the, the, and know that you're not delivering from 20 20 minutes out. You're literally around the corner. So, uh, so we've done that, and and we, we were able to turn a, a business which was struggling from a financial perspective into a hugely profitable business today for us. I mean, uh, all the dark kitchens we've opened recently, uh, from the second month they turn a profit. Even the dark kit, the, the virtual brands, the couple that we're operating uh, are making profit out of these dark kitchens. Um, and so when you use dark kitchens uh, with a very specific purpose uh, and you're uh, super strict about, you know, having to meet certain criteria in order to open dark kitchen in a, in a certain area, then you, they can be a great enabler to your business. Uh, and we're going to continue building dark kitchens. I think uh, on dark kitchen, and you very strongly said that dark kitchen being profitable. I, uh, I wonder, and I, you know, of course, this is uh, my, from my vantage point. It is also information, uh, you know. But but mostly, it's uh, it's not the information of the numbers. It's the information of the of the economics, uh, you know, of any business. And I'm talking about country level economics, right? Because we. We look. We 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 have aggregators placing orders in collective brands doing you know at a country level. We know AOVs, etc. And when we when we when I see that, I I believe that it's borderline impossible to turn a profit on a duck kitchen, unless of course you're flying either insane volumes or insane AOVs the, the, yeah. then th those can be outliers but for a like mid-level AOV mid-level traffic it's very difficult because that pie does not have the juice I mean like one mistake I mean even if you're super efficient I I'm yet to see like somebody reporting like a bottom line theoretical bottom line possibility of five percent sure. it's very difficult what's what's happening here so I'll go back to the content at the end of the day, uh, and and <coughs> I'm gonna bore you a little bit with a with a little bit of a PNL structure and, sure, uh, and why why do, why did people first get into dark kitchens, sure. right? There's a couple of lines in the PNL, uh, so let's assume that food cost is pretty much the same, right? Whether you're operating, uh, actually it's a, it's it's higher in the dark kitchen because you've got the packaging element. 100 sure. percent of your sales are uh, deliveries versus in the and product. let's get into numbers. Right? Tell me the cogs and tell me the packaging cogs. So cogs, I mean, if you want to operate profitably, you want to reach a cogs which is below 25% mm. theoretical food cost. Mm. Packaging, you're probably going to be, depending on how much you want to invest and the AOV, because that's the, that's the biggest uh, impact. You're probably going to be somewhere in the 2% range if you're not investing a lot to 5% range if you're really, you know, putting... Uh, very uh, premium packaging into your into your product. Will, will you be able to do that in five? You can do that within five percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, if you have volumes, because uh, packaging is a volume game. Correct. Right? I mean, the, there is the the yeah, higher my, the my the, perception of high end packaging, honestly, is like as high as eight percent. Of course, if your AOV is very very high, again, it gets. If your AOV is high, or if your volumes are high, which which command, I mean. The, the 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 as you know i mean the from packaging suppliers the higher the, the, <coughs> correct the, the how, how much can you exactly you know, order how much can you consume uh but you can reach three to five percent okay, i mean we 5%. don't have so call it five percent then the biggest two lines where you can really create an impact when you're in a dark kitchen uh, versus when you're in a brick and mortar in a mold for example is the rent and sure. the labor cost mm. The rent because you're not paying. I mean, if you're in a mall location, you'll end up paying 12% in a good case scenario, 15% in an average scenario, all the way up to sometimes 20% if you're not doing great volumes in a in a high uh, in a in a very uh, Correct. high footfall mall. Which and, and, and high rent. you're on a bad spot. I think after 15, you start getting after 15 spot. starts being becoming very difficult yeah. to make money. Um, so when you're in the dark kitchen, if you do enough volumes, you could drop below 5% occupancy cost. Sure. Uh, so that's kind of 7 to 10% that you've able to, you're mm. able to save on your bottom line. Mm. Now, labor costs, you have only the production people. You don't have the front, front of, of house, house. To, uh, to, to, serve the, to serve your staff. You have some dispatch people. So these are the, and you've got the managerial or supervisory layer on top. But you're able to uh, save on labor costs on paper. 
but the 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 the, the lines where people have grossly underestimated the the structure of a PNL in a dark kitchen when you're running not great content when your brands are not premium brands which have which carry a strong brand equity is two lines on the PNL it's discounting and it's marketing so your only way to the customer is through the aggregators let's sure. face it today we're in a world where we have we have we have our own channel we have our, we have our own channel we're pushing an omni-channel project. We want all of the brands to be under the same roof. But omni-channel includes aggregators and the customer. I mean, you need to follow where the customer is. And the customers today are, are going towards aggregators because of the convenience and, you know, for a ton of reasons why. Which no, we, I mean, we you, and me, to... you and me will also go to of aggregators, course, right? Because of convenience, if not discounts. Well, the, 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 I try as a restaurateur to, uh, to go direct. Uh, to support my, your, your uh, my empathy, peers, your empathy is but, uh, but eventually, uh, eventually, the customer does not think like that. Sure. Uh, and so, your only way to the aggregate to the customers through the aggregators, and today the race has been on the aggregators for visibility uh, has been huge. I mean, the, there's a huge oversupply of restaurants in Dubai, whether they are physical restaurants or virtual restaurants, and so. If you if you want to get a share of the mind of the customer on the aggregator, you need to start investing, and you invest That's in two marketing. different ways, marketing. So uh, they've all figured that out, and they started uh, their schemes where where you can uh, you know pay per click and uh, uh, banners uh, where you buy where you buy visibility on the aggregators mm. to be out there, especially when you have a, a brand which is not recognized by the customers. Uh, so that's a big. Uh, underestimation of how much you end up spending. So, so you spend much more uh, on the marketing line, and sometimes it could go to you know ten percent, fifteen percent of your sales. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I see. I see global spend. average being uh, ten to twelve percent right. on aggregators. Exactly. So, so now the, the the customer saw you. Maybe he will click, but now you need to entice him to order from you. So you need to give him a discount. Because now all the market is discount driven, and mm. so, so, uh, so all the aggregators are putting huge, uh, you know, advantage or visibility, and campaigns are going. I mean, you can, if you just listen to radio or see billboards, every week there is a big campaign going, uh, going on, on you know, getting fifty percent off certain items, uh, buying, you know, buy one get one, etc. So you need to give discounts for people to try you, especially if the brand is not again, if it's not strong. And so when you add that, and the discounts are significant, mm. um, it could go from 20% all the way to 50%. Uh, we've, I've even seen people put a 60% discount on that, which is, I think is it's crazy. 60. 60. All right. 60% discount. Uh, and when you add, you know, uh, the fact that uh, another line, which is the aggregator commission, uh, where when you have a mixed, when a hybrid model where you have on, more than half of your sales, if you're a restaurant, you don't pay commissions. Mm. And uh, versus a mother where you're going 100% through aggregators, uh, who will take anywhere between, call it 20 in the 20% range if you're a very large group, all the way to 35% probably if you're a mom and pop single store trying to uh, trying to do deliveries. Um, when you add everything up, it doesn't add up. You start losing money. On every order you're yeah. you're generating, and so uh, the aggregator will tell you we're only taking 35 percent of uh, or 30 percent of your uh, your top line, uh, and you've got a food cost which is a 25 percent, maybe 30 with the packaging. Uh, then look, you've got a 40 percent contribution margin on that. Yeah, but, but I mean, they're ignoring labor, they're ignoring rent. I mean, all the other items, and so you're in a scenario where you're losing money, like you said. I mean, uh, on average. So the way you break that is to go back to line by line. You can only break that if you have a strong brand. If you have a brand which resonates with customers, which the, and usually today, let's face it, we're in a, an ex, it, there's it's an experiential industry. People like still to go out, exchange with their friends, uh, and so what we lost during COVID came back and even stronger after COVID. Uh, and so strong brand equity for me means. Physical presence. Being how do you? Fit. How do you? What, what is the metric that you measure across channels or on aggregators? Given that they don't tell you who the customer, they don't give you the data. 
what metric tells you that it's all well? Uh, multiple metrics. Uh, one metric, they so what they don't give you, uh, but they, uh, as at the customer level, but they can give you as a overall is uh, the percent of repeat orders. Repeat. Right. So this they they are they are happy to share with you. Uh, the click through rate. So how much? How many of people who have visited your page sure. actually went on and uh, and, order. Uh, and order? Created a your product. customer rating. Obviously, that's the that's the the most obvious and visible to everyone. Basically, uh, your ability to be a price leader in your category uh, <laughs> and still generate volumes. I mean, eventually, this is the biggest. Uh, you mean for what, me the, the the for me the biggest proxy to to brand equity is the willingness to spend of the customer. You mean price product. leader means like the, yeah, the being, top, being, being the top price, price. price be, being able to price higher than your competitors and still generate volumes. 100%. Uh, so I think when you think of companies like Apple, uh, they're able to, with a, with a similar product, command a 30, 40% premium in, in price. More than that, actually. I mean, if you, if you compare to what Android goes for in so many countries in the world, sure. Like, like Apple can go for yeah, yeah. almost as as much as a thousand percent premium. Sure, and so eventually there mm. are a lot of KPIs that you're able to look at and to to give you a sense of how you're doing from a brand equity perspective. How are you being perceived by the customer? Do you measure all these religiously? We we do it religiously. Uh, uh, we have meetings with all the agri. I mean, we have the advantage of being uh, on the larger side as a group. Versus some of the you know moms and pops and, and how small, many small how many concepts and how many we have locations? we have nine brands and uh, across forty locations uh, between UAE and Saudi Arabia mostly in the UAE um, uh, and so we do uh, if not uh, monthly quarterly meetings with each of the aggregators where we do a full uh, business review at the brand level at the site level uh, understand what's going on so this is this is where I participate. But there is ongoing discussions every day with the, between the aggregators and ourselves to give us uh, visibility on how we're doing ops metrics, how much uh, percentage of uh, orders were delayed where the rider had to wait at the restaurant, mm. uh, how much time were we open uh, on the platform versus closed, how much percentage of our items were visible versus out of stock. I mean, everything is measured. I mean, the advantage of... Uh, working with aggregators, which are all tech companies, is they've got data and they cut it and slice it the way you want. And if you're, as long as you ask for it, and you don't go uh, into you know territories which are which where you you ask them about market share, their market share, or your market share within them, um, or your competitors' numbers, obviously, uh, they're quite happy to share. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, your interest in aggregators' interest technically is aligned. Yes, you cannot win them, or they cannot win you yeah. by being against each other. You have to no, be on course. the same side. Of course, uh, they of course are biting from your from your pie. But I but I think one thing that you touched upon quite strongly, and I personally am a believer of, is that uh, you know for an aggregator, assuming and given that you both are on the same side, the brand and the aggregator, if you actually are able to generate brand pull. And if an aggregator understands from their data that a large part of your customers actually search your name yeah. and then click and then convert, uh, you know whether they give you that data or not, but you will always be in the power position to negotiate better commissions. Of course. Because at the end of the day, you know, they they just want to make sure that there is a repeat business happening. And if they can see that, okay, your traffic is your traffic, they can they can discount that. And this is this is why been, there's been a war for exclusivity by the, between the aggregators. I mean, it's it's even more uh, aggressive. Yeah, that, that only Europe. happens for the brands who exactly. have weight. Exactly. Yeah. But, but in Europe, it's even more aggressive between Deliveroo and Uber, for example. Uber Eats, uh, like people, like brands getting hundreds <coughs> of thousands of dollars up front to go exclusive with them, because the aggregators understand the power of the brands and the pull. I mean, people will follow the some some. Some people will uh, will uh, follow the aggregator, but some brands, if they, they, they know that the brand is only available on that aggregator, will go out of their way to get their brand, the brand they want to order from. And the aggregators understand that. And so eventually, uh, it is still a race. I think it's a bit less aggressive today in the, in the, in the market right now. Um, the race for exclusivity of the of the brand. I think I think uh, that's 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 UAE because uh, the uh, UAE's uh, 
I think it's quite monopolistic now for, you know, let's say delivery or uh, sure. talabat, right? Uh, but in the markets where monopoly is not, I mean, the, the share is not that skewed, the race is on. But it depends on your concept. So, for example, today uh, you've got uh, Talabat, <coughs> which is the leader in the market. Uh, you've got Deliveroo, you've got Karim, which is uh, ramping up their volumes. You've got Noon as well, which is uh, which is looking into entering more aggressively into the food business. Uh, but depending on your concept, you would know. I mean, some of the brands we know, okay, this is a Talabat brand. Oh, this is more of a Deliveroo brand because of right. the customer, uh, the customer yeah. base behind them. So Deliveroo still is, is a very european centered centric uh you know heavy customer base right uh westerners i uh, wouldn't say only europeans but westerners in, in mm. general i mean uh, talabat has a more a stronger arabic or kind of uh, emirati slash arabic uh, following uh, what happened to the zomatos base did it did it go to talabat truly or so, did it go to like did it got so divided? it's an interesting question because um when when they acquired uh, Zomato and eventually when Zomato decided to exit the market, Talabat had all the tools to uh, I mean they had all the you know customer data etc. Uh, to to recover the the Zomato volumes, um, or a very large proportion of the Zomato volumes. Um, but what I've, what what we've seen at the time we were not on noon, um, but what we've seen is it hasn't happened that way. It got spread across multiple platforms. Uh, so we saw, so for example, we were in, with Sushi Art with Zomato. We saw the Talabat volumes go up with Sushi Art. We saw the Deliveroo volumes go up with Sushi Art. Uh, and w- hearing anecdotally about, about it from other people, we understand that Noon uh, recovered a bunch of their, uh, of the Zomato customers uh, because of who the customer is behind Zomato. So Zomato, to go back to this analogy, there was a lot of... Uh, um, uh, South Asian <coughs> kind of po- yeah. po- population behind uh, going after the, be, given the Zomato, uh, the you know, Zomato where it's coming from Correct. initially, and so uh, they followed Noon apparently more. So I'm not. I, I wouldn't say that Talabat didn't uh, or Deliver Hero didn't uh, manage that properly, but eventually they did. They went aggressively with the uh, with the trying you know aggressive offers to the, the Zomato customers to bring them to Talabat, but you know the 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 all the aggregators were ready. For the disconnection day of uh, Talabat, right? They all went on aggressive discounting for a few weeks afterwards, knowing that uh, they, they there was probably there, there's a, a large base, a five to ten percent market share of the uh, of the UAE market, probably closer to five, uh, that was up for grabs, and so uh, so eventually it got split. I think Talabat got the most of it, but uh, but still the other people got it based on the customer who are behind it. I think you talked about in between <clears throat> that. Uh, you know, from being second in line when you became, you, you were at the forefront for a while in between. Um, you know, it was it was quite um, um, it was quite a task to yeah. be suddenly you know sensitive and to you know manage the emotional crisis of yeah. the people side of the things as well. What's this Nadim 2.0 in the current one? How are you as a leader and you know? How have you, like, what are the two, three things that you feel have evolved inside you? Yeah. So, first of all, I I, I was able to see it from the outside. And I mean, that allowed me to really evaluate the business uh, from the outside and and, uh, coming up with a plan, with a hundred days plan of what I wanted to do when I'm back. Um, So that helped. Um, Seeing other leaders operate while I was at MAF also helped me uh, do that. But at the end of the day, there was a positive momentum when I came back. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, so, some people in the organization were happy to, 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 I mean, people I was close to were happy to, to see me back. Mm. Um, there were a few uh, modifications that were done on my, uh, on my direct line of reporting as well. Uh, I've made some, some decisions in terms of uh, uh, you know, bringing new people in, um, and uh, and eventually, you need to show results. People, people, whether it's your board or your team, they need to be behind you. Uh, and so, I want to say, people signed up to uh, to my plan. Uh, eventually, when I came back, it, well, I was very clear about what I wanted to do with the business, with both with my board as well as with my management team. Um, uh, I put it on paper. I, you know, I presented it to the whole, you know, head office organization, 
uh, and so most people uh, were uh, supported. Uh, and so at, at the end, people see good results. They continue supporting you. So today I've had to, I've had to uh, handle crises, uh, but having, having a first, because now it's been a little over a year that I'm back, having had strong financial results uh, uh, has definitely helped me uh, navigate through this, uh, the, the, these times. Now, how I've developed as a leader, I think if I had to define myself for the few words, I would probably say I'm an empathetic team builder. The way my my way of management is try to gather a team of strong individuals who are each very strong in their own areas of expertise and try to get them all to shoot in the same direction. <coughs> um, I've seen when I was at math people who were able to uh, to do that and that uh, you know I've learned quite a bit from them. Uh, I've learned empathy from uh, you know. Some of the some of the, my, uh, you know my life experiences on the personal level in the past, uh, I've learned it from Andy, uh, my, the previous CEO of Ethos, especially during the COVID period, um, and I, I have this ability to put myself in other people's shoes and see it from their perspective, which a lot of leaders cannot do or are not willing to do, uh, and so I'm able to do that. I'm I'm a kind of work hard, play hard type of uh, type of leader. Uh, or I want this to be in the organization. Uh, I don't believe, so, so you know, some people uh, advise against you know building personal relationships in the workspace. Um, we spend so much time in the with our colleagues that if you if you artificially want to build walls, it's counterproductive at the end of the day. So I think I'm not I'm not a proponent of uh, of you know uh, you know building artificially walls. We will build relationships. We will become friends. We will see sometimes each other out, outside of work, uh, and this will strengthen the, the work as much as long as you're able to to make the difference between you know this is personal, this is professional, and not uh, and not start uh, you know uh, not, not the, per- the personal relationship not starting to affect your your professional uh, dealings with these people. I think that like absolutely, and I and I just want to make a point here, just building upon what you said. I totally agree with that, and I think. A large part of uh, current urban uh, mental health crises is honestly a function of uh, this this feeling, information, undercurrent, whatever you call it, that hey, you don't have relationships at workplace or you don't uh, you know hang out with people you work with. I think that's like a sure shot signing up for a mental health crisis yeah. for sure. Because people you are spending your like almost two third of waking life yeah. with, yeah. if you can't relate to them right. and you're trying to seek some uh, relationships on weekends, right. you're screwed. Yeah. Uh, you're hundred and one percent screwed. I think you'll you'll be you miserable. Have, you'll be miserable. I mean, yeah, you'll have to fill that gap with a the therapist. Yeah, uh, yeah. There is no other way. Therapy is not bad, but the point is that if you're exactly. if you're signing up for that uh, instead of you know having relationships at work, it's, I, I'm a I'm a big believer of. Of, of that either yeah. you work with people who you can relate to or you start relating to people exactly. you work with whichever way it works for you and and another thing i mean going back to the to your question on nadim 2.0 there's this very the, the notion of trust trust so some people will say trust needs to be earned uh, so i won't trust you know my my direct uh, managers until they earn that trust mm. so i come from a different philosophy i give my trust um, and uh, so I, I see the you know I see the positive things in people. I, I give my trust by default. Um, but one very, very strong uh, thing that I learned in my early days in private equity, one of my uh, my, my direct uh, managers told me, trust does not exclude control. This is a very interesting line that I've kept. Mm. So I trust you, but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to review the work you're submitting. I'm not going <coughs> to check on you, etc. So I give my trust by default, uh, but I control. I, I see. I see. One very important aspect is communication. I'm trusting you, but you need to communicate with me. You need to tell me whenever you're facing an issue. Um, 
hopefully you come back you come back with what the issue is and what is your proposed solution rather than give me a problem right but uh, but I trust you by default but but the, on the flip side if I lose my trust in people it's very difficult to go back from there so um, I see that and I try to you know instill it in my kids today I've got three kids um, and you know kids I'm clear we've been kids there are things you say to your parents, things you don't say to your parents. But I try to tell them uh, to reinforce this this notion of trust and and how how difficult is it it is to recover trust once people have lost trust in you. Mm. Um, but by default, I give my trust. And uh, and but it's happened in the past that you know some people have not delivered, and uh, and uh, we've gotten to the conclusion that uh, that uh, it's not productive to continue in this uh, in this relationship because. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, you know, uh, toxic for both uh, both parties. Mm. And the other thing is, um, uh, on on the, my type of management, I'm not a micromanager. And uh, to go back to the previous point, I mean, eventually, if you if you feel me breathing down your neck, that probably means there's an issue. Um, uh, so I'm not a micromanager, but I'm uh, I need internal communication to be uh, at its best all the time. Eventually, I need to be informed. I cannot. I cannot be blindsided at the end of the day. That's the uh, that's the most important thing for me. But as I see people delivering, I mean, we we, inter- we implemented the uh, OKRs after my uh, my return to uh, to Ethos. Uh, we're tracking it on a biweekly basis, uh, so people can you know there is this forum where we we discuss this at the leadership level on a on a on a on a you know biweekly basis. Uh, if we start deviating, people will see it, and uh, I think it's very important eventually. But I let them do their thing. I let them, uh, and I'm there to, you know, call, call decisions when they need to be called, resolve conflicts when they need to be resolved. Um, but let them do their own thing. At the end of the day, my ops director is a much better operator than I am. My marketing director is a much better marketeer than I will ever be. So uh, get out of their way, uh, but be able to. Align them towards what the what the vision of the company is, and have them uh, you know uh, portray the values of the company as we've selected them. So that's one of the things that I did right after, a couple of months after by being back, as we 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 took a couple of days off, uh, and and decided collectively as a management team what was the company purpose, vision, uh, and values, and we're trying to stick to it because it's the fruit of a collective exercise, mm. and so people uh, people feel like they uh, they own it. Nadim, how do you how do you nurture yourself? What's your <clears throat> how do you learn, or or do you do anything uh, specifically to you know keep yourself fresh, nurtured, yeah. challenged, growing? So so um, I've learned. I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a cancer survivor. So um, uh, when I was 22 years old, I was uh, diagnosed with the uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was in Stanford studying. Um, so oh. so it allowed me to, uh, it was a very traumatic experience at the time, but eventually being able to get out of it and uh, still being, you know, around 20 years later uh, has made me a stronger person, but also realigned my priorities. And so health is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a very important uh, element now in my life. I mean, I've, I've went through ups, uh, I've gone through ups and downs from a health perspective, but uh, the way I nurture myself right now is I've picked up a sport recently called sport uh, called touch tennis, which is a, a, a variant of the of tennis basically. Touch tennis. Touch tennis, which is different than paddle, which uh, which is kind of um, uh, in the, uh, the, the the sport everyone is playing today. But basically, smaller court than tennis. Uh, it's low, like pickleball. Lower in that. It's quite close to pickleball, but uh, but uh, different. You use the same type of racket as the tennis. Uh, only a smaller one, uh, softer, uh, softer, softer, ball. softer ball. Exactly. I think it's it's a variant of it's very, very. Yeah, okay. And so I'm doing that. I got hooked to that. So I, I use that as a as a. I think it's the most fun way you can ever, sp- <coughs> you know, burn 600 calories in an hour. Mm. So I try to do that as much as uh, my body allows. So now I'm having a little bit of, you know, knee knee issues and uh, and uh, shoulder issues. So that's what I do from a health perspective. Uh, to nurture my soul, I'm a foodie. And so I uh, I enjoy going out on restaurant and you know meeting people and uh, enjoying new restaurants, uh, which gets on my wife's nerves sometimes because when we would go and plan a trip, 
um, <laughs> the trip would be you know centered around where which restaurants <laughs> we need we need to to, to visit. I I, uh, I I I know I, I know the feeling. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, so she's like, I, I, I uh, eat to live. You live to eat, and uh, that's pretty not far from reality. I mean, we were in Rome with the, with my kids and my wife this uh, summer, uh, and I got them to to wait for forty five minutes in the, in line to 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 eat the pizza, and they were like, "Come on, we're not gonna wait." I'm like, "Believe me, it's gonna be worth it." And so, <laughs> at the end of the meal, they were all like, "Oh yeah, this is one of the best pizzas we've ever had." So so yeah, I'm, uh, and that and that and that's so much gratification as well. Exactly, you the pizza, exactly. Right? Like, I still remind like them the, today. You're like the <laughs> proud, you're like the proud daddy saying, "See, exactly. I, I found this place." Exactly. They were not very happy during the 45 minutes we're waiting in line, but uh, but eventually, yeah. I mean, uh, dealing with people around the meal. I mean, uh, interacting, sharing stories. This is what nurtures my uh, my soul. Um, and what for the mind? Uh, I've started picking up a few podcasts recently, uh, audiobooks. I'm not a big reader. Uh, audiobooks has helped me. Uh, uh, Which one did you listen or listen? So I, I, I listened to Setting the Table by uh, Danny Mayer uh, mm. recently, which was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. Uh, the character is, uh, is, is amazing. I have, I mean, I visit, you know, restaurants as well. I, I have... I, I inspire myself from restaurants I, uh, I visit uh, also. I mean, there's a few, there's a lot of, you know, restaurateurs in Dubai, which, uh, which I uh, admire. Uh, one of them could be the uh, Natasha Sideris from the, the Tasha's group. I mean, everything they do is the attention to detail, the quality, uh, the service uh, is incredible. I mean, uh, every, in every venue that they uh, that they open. Uh, I haven't met her personally. Hopefully, it will come. Uh, I'm, soon. you know, my team has been, you know, trying to get her uh, schedule aligned. Uh, so someday soon, uh, I would love. I, I'll be getting her on the couch to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to chat about those details. Yeah, no, but it's. Uh, I mean, some people will just get it right, and uh, and she's been able to to create concepts which have a very strong identity. And uh, and who get people to come back and eventually be able to go back to the brand equity part, uh, have people have a willingness to pay which is higher than, uh, yeah, than their yeah. competitors. No, I see them. I I, I totally see that. Yeah. Uh, who else uh, apart from them that you admire? Uh, I respect a lot uh, Mert Askin, who's I mean going into the larger group uh, who Azadea. runs Azadea. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think he's a great leader. Um, I'm good friends with uh, Samir Hamade, who has, uh, who's the founder of Akibadori, uh, MB Square Pizza, and he's opened, you know, some nightlife venues as well. So there's a few people. I don't want to list too many people. Then I'll end up forgetting a few. Yeah, but the great, these, uh, these three are but, already uh, great. But yeah, yeah, I have a lot of, a uh, lot of, you know, good connections. I've, uh, I enjoy going to these conferences, meet new people, you know, bounce, bounce ideas. I mean, that's also what I do for my mind. Is, is uh, is interaction with people from the industry, getting good ideas, um, you know, on podcasts as well. I mean, I, I, I like to have a walk when everyone's asleep. Uh, I live not far from uh, from uh, from uh, Kite Beach uh, in the Jumeirah area. So I would go at 11 p.m., 12 p.m., go walk for an hour and listen to podcasts and get inspired and, uh, and go back and, you know, take some notes on my phone and, and try to implement them in, uh, in my, whether my life or my, uh, my business. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's what I do to, to stay busy. Nadim, this was, uh, this was absolutely a phenomenal conversation for not only, you know, like such a great journey, but also there are so many things that I resonate and agree with you on that. It's, 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 it's amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and, and your secrets, um, uh, <laughs> I'm sure people who will listen to this are going to love it. Thanks, Ashish. Thanks for having me. And uh, I really enjoyed it as well. I mean, it, it went very smoothly and fast, actually. Uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward to more conversations with you. Awesome. Thank you, Ashish.